I'm so grateful that you're here. My name is Matt, and I'm the senior pastor here at Grace. Welcome. If I have not had a chance to meet you, I would love to have that chance uh, before, the, before our time is up today and before you leave, and so um, I would love to do that. Let me encourage you to take your Bible and to go with me to Colossians chapter 1. That's where we're going to be today as we turn to God's Word, Colossians chapter 1. We're in a series through this, this New Testament book that's going to take us right up until Christmas, and today we come, uh, we're still in chapter 1, and we come to verses 15 to 23, which is just an incredible passage of Scripture. Uh, let me encourage you as well, the app that was mentioned earlier, you can find some notes there that'll be helpful to you. They're on the home screen. Those are also in hard copy form in the back of the room if you would like to get them there. Now, let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me go back to something that I said last week. So, uh, l- last week I shared two observations with you about what it means to be uh, a believer today. I, I, the first observation we made was this. It, it seems very true to me, and I think it's true to all of us, that um, in terms of our access to God's Word, to the access that we have um, to God's Word, we really, we really have a level of access that no one else in history has ever had. Um, you know, as we turn and open up our Bibles, there's really no one has had the kind of access that we have. Uh, but, but the second observation we made is true too, and that is that, that no, one, no one has had access to the amount of distractions that we can have that can distract us from the access that we have to God's Word. And I think both of those things are true. What, what, what I want to do is go back to the first observation about how thankful we should be for the access that we have to the Bible. I, it, is, it is an absolute privilege, brothers and sisters, this morning that we have access to Colossians 1, verses 15 to 23. This is an incredible passage of Scripture that is worth knowing, memorizing, and hiding in your heart as those serious about following Jesus. That's what this passage is. This is perhaps the most Christ-centered passage of Scripture in the Bible. To say it another way, nowhere else in the Bible is the character, glory, supremacy, superiority of Jesus more described and concentrated than it is here, and we have access to it. So friends, my, my, really my basic message to you this morning is, behold the supremacy of Jesus. Would you stand and let's see what, see what this has for us today. I just want you to listen as I read. There's a few things in the text that I want to emphasize as I read, so I want to do that, so just listen. We're starting in verse 15, and we're going to read down to verse 23. Colossians 1, verse 15, listen as I read. These are the words of God. Speaking of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, you, who were once alienated and enemies in mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is God's word. Lord Jesus, we pray now that by your spirit what we know not you would teach us, what we have not you would give us, and what we are not, you would make us. Jesus, for your sake and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take your seats, everybody. Thanks. Our focus today is the supremacy of Christ, and that's really the focus of this study. The message of Colossians is the supremacy of Christ, that Jesus is unique, that Jesus is supreme over all things and in all things, that we should center our lives on Him, that there really is no other place where we should. And it's really highlighted here. We've, we've been saying that there are certain words that we need to use of Jesus that are really unique to Him. Words like amplify, exalt, celebrate, praise, worship. Uh, these are words that 
here of all places in this local church that celebrates Jesus together, we should know these things and hide them in our hearts and do them regularly. And so I I think the message in a sentence, I I think verses 15 to 23, this incredible passage that we have access to, I, I think it's simply this. I think Paul is teaching us this morning that Jesus Christ is superior to everything in every way. Jesus Christ is superior to everything in every way. Brothers and sisters, Christians and non-Christians, behold the supremacy of Jesus. There are four reasons in this passage why we can say that Jesus Christ, the God-man, raised from the dead, is superior to everything in every way. Reason number one, Jesus is superior to everything in every way, friends, because Jesus is God. Jesus is God. That's the meaning of the first line of this passage in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. God, by his very definition, is invisible. He is omnipresent, but doesn't fill space in the same way that you and I do. He doesn't have parts. He doesn't have a body. He does it different than we do. And yet, he is everywhere equally all the time. The idea here is that of image. You see that word there. He is the image. Uh, the, 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 word, the word is icon. In Paul's context, an icon was a, was, a, was, was a stamp of an original that contained no deviations or differences and was known to be an exact representation of the original. The meaning here is that God the Son from all eternity veiled in flesh as the person of Jesus Christ, is the full, complete, total revelation of God. Hebrews 1, this is the first of many times I'll quote Hebrews 1, speaks in this way, that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. John 1 Another parallel to Colossians 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus in his context, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, so there we have two gods that are equal, existing together. He goes on at the end of that, cha- at the end of that section to say, no one has ever seen God, the only God, now we have two of them, now we have Trinity, he has made him known. Here's the point I'm making to you. If someone comes up to you and says, I want to know what God is like, you could accurately and wisely tell them, then consider Jesus. He will tell you what God is like. Friends, the first reason Jesus is supreme is because Jesus is God with no deviations and no differences. Reason number two, Jesus is supreme. Jesus is supreme to everything in every way because he created everything, is the reason for everything, and sustains everything. In the first half of verse 15, Paul makes this phrase. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, and then he says, the firstborn over all creation. Now, from, from verse 15, the second half of verse 15, down to verse 17, Paul is describing the supremacy of Jesus, the superiority of Jesus, the uniqueness of Jesus in relation to physical creation. And so he calls him, in the second half of verse 15, the firstborn over all creation. Now, we need to understand what the language of firstborn means. This is important. Firstborn here, because it's going to be used again, firstborn does not mean uh, that, that Jesus was born in the sense of that he, there was a time when he did not exist. God the Son always was. He never came into existence. He was God and he is with God. He is God. God the Son is God. He possesses all divine attributes, including the attribute of eternality. He never had a beginning. So when he calls him the firstborn, that language means two things in the New Testament. One, first in rank. Second, first in sequence. Here, it's a reference to the first. He's saying that Jesus is first in regards to creation and rank. Of all the things that are created, Jesus is first. He's the best. He's the greatest. He then goes on in verse 16 to praise Jesus through prepositions. By, through, 
and 4. Verse 16 is the highest praise you could give to anything or anyone. And here it is used of Jesus. Look at verse 16. For by him, mark it down, all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. That is the highest praise you could give to any, to look, to speak of anything and to say, all, so and notice how exhaustive the language in the passage is. It's all in everything. All in everything. So this is exhaustive supremacy. This is absolute supremacy. This is total. We know that's true because not of just of all the exclusive language of all, but of the language of heaven and earth in verse 16. See that there that are in heaven and on earth. All things were created by him. So whenever you see in the Bible, heaven and earth, that's the Bible's way of saying how we would say from A to Z, from beginning to end, from left to right. We believe as Christians there are two levels of reality, only two, God and not God. That's all that exists, God and everything that isn't him. The point of this passage is Jesus made it all, and it's all for him and it's all through him. Paul praises him in a unique way. In verse 16, he says, the highest view of Jesus possible, one, that he is the origin and cause of everything. Number two, that he is the one through whom all things were made. He is the agent of creation. We could speak of him in that way. And number three, that all things are for him or toward him. Everything has a reason or a goal, and it is Christ. It is Jesus. It's not me. It's not you. It's him. That's the highest view of anyone you could have. You should not have a higher view of anyone than the view you have of Jesus because he's superior to everyone and everything. One author put it like this. I just want to make sure we're under, we understand what's being said. I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to quote him because I, just, I read it and I thought I, can't, I just can't say it any better. Uh, one author put it like this. All things, quote, were created for him. And all that came into being exists for Christ. That is, it exists to display the greatness of Christ. Nothing, nothing in the universe exists for its own sake. Everything from the bottom of the oceans to the top of the mountains, from the smallest particle to the biggest star, from the most boring school subject to the most fascinating science, from the ugliest cockroach to the most beautiful human, from the greatest saint to the most wicked genocidal dictator, everything that exists, exists to make the greatness of Christ more fully known, including you. Notice what Paul singles out in verse 16. He says, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. So of all the things to single out, that's what he singles out. Thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. Everyone agrees that this is a reference in the New Testament to unseen spiritual powers, angels and demons, good and bad. This is how they're referred to. Why does Paul insert this? He inserts it for this reason. One of the false teachings influencing this small group of believers in this first century, first century city, in this first century church, was this idea that perhaps Jesus is just one of many spiritual beings. Maybe he is just one rung on a ladder of spiritual beings, of intermediaries. That's how angels are sometimes referred to in the Bible. Intermediaries, they go, they're go-betweens. Maybe he's just one of many that you must climb in order to get to God. Paul's point is that can't be true because he made everything on the ladder. Jesus never agreed to have an equal seat in the hall of spiritual beings. He made the spiritual beings. Thrones, dominion, some, some, some say he, Paul could be meaning spiritual beings and, and physical beings like rulers of the world. It doesn't matter. Jesus made all of it. That's his point. And so he's telling the Colossians, you need Christ, not, not a set of intermediaries. You don't need to climb a ladder of which Jesus is one of them. He created all of these things. Jesus is superior in every way. Amen. And that includes us. 
Jesus also is involved in the continued existence of everything. This is the point of verse 17. He says, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Your Bible may say all things are upheld. Again, Hebrews 1 says that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. As one author put it, the cosmos do not fly into chaos because of Jesus. We are not deists who believe that even if the world was created by the God of the Bible, he set it up in such a way that it runs without any of his intervention or help. No, no, no. The world stays together because the king holds it together. All things consist in him. Matter. I I am not an astrophysicist. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a doctor. (laughs) I didn't even stay at a Holiday Inn Express. You know, I know the things that I know, okay? But I know that this world is incredibly complex. And Jesus upholds it all. Can you imagine the effect that this would have on this small band of first... Look, look, the city of Colossae, is, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything really... It was, it was significant at one time. It's not really significant now. It's not Rome. It's not Ephesus, its cousin, which is about 30 miles away. It's not, it's not any of these places. There's nothing incredibly significant about Colossae. They're, 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 they're just trying to follow Jesus faithfully right in the middle of the first century Roman Empire. Can you imagine the impact... It would have on them to to, to have a letter brought to them that says that a man who up until recently, look, one of the the reasons you need to have confidence in the Bible is because the things that are written in the New Testament that are attested to about Jesus, we know from history are written within the lifetime of people who saw this stuff. Can you imagine the effect this would have on a group of people who were being told that up until recently, within their lifetime, a man who was walking around holds the universe together? You mean the guy that was healing people? Yeah. He's upholding everything, including you. Friends, the second reason Jesus is superior is because he made everything. He's the reason for everything, and he upholds everything. Third reason, Jesus is superior to everything in every way. The third reason is because he was raised from the dead and is Lord of the church. Now, here's an outline of verses 15 to 23. Up until this point, Paul has been speaking of Jesus' supremacy in relation to the physical creation, all things that exist. Now he turns and speaks to Jesus' supremacy in relation to the new creation, the new existence, the new humanity, the church. That's what starts in verse 18. He says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So again, the outline, physical creation and new creation. The point of verse 18 is that Jesus, similar to physical creation, is the origin, source, Lord, and sustainer of the new creation, the church. He refers to him with these these different, as the head of the body. Now, there are many metaphors in the Bible used to describe the church. There's the flock, there's the bride, there's the family, there's the kingdom, there's the building. Each informs what a church is and what a church does. But the most profoundly illuminating metaphor is the body. This refers to Christ as the head. This means, what this means is that Christ and his people are spiritually united He's united to his body in a way that, that's a little bit of a mystery, but we can't quite see, but we know it's true. The, an illustration of this would be when Paul, um, Paul is on his way, uh, this is in Acts chapter 8, he's Saul at this point, he, just, he, he was just the supervisor of the stoning of Stephen, and he's on his way to do the same thing to other Christians. Jesus shows up uh, and says, I got different plans for you. He shows up and he, and, he, and, he, and he looks at Jesus and he says, Saul, Saul, or Jesus looks at him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, that's because he's the head and and they're the body. It's because he is united to his people. That's why why he's doing that. Physical creation and new creation. It is from Jesus that we receive direction and draw life as a church. Each of the illustration informs what we think about the church, but the most profound and illuminating is the body. And he is this for one reason, because he was raised from the dead. Okay. 
He says in verse, the middle of verse 18 that he is the firstborn from the dead. Do you see that right there? Look down at your Bible. You see that? He is the firstborn from the dead. Second time you see that. It means two things, right? It means first in sequence and first in rank. It doesn't mean first in rank here. It means first in sequence. Here's the interesting thing about the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, in the Bible, Jesus, Jesus is not the first person to be raised from the dead. He's not the only person to be raised from the dead. Right? There's lots of resurrections in the Bible. Jesus raised people from the dead. What's the difference? Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Lazarus is not the firstborn from the dead. I always thought it would be interesting to be Lazarus, the, the really good friend of Jesus that he raised from the dead in John 11. You know, you're at, a, you're at a dinner party and everybody's bragging about their accomplishments. And he's like, I got raised from the dead, you know. <laughs> well, well, what happened to Lazarus? He died again. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead because he is the first one who took sin on a cross, took it into a grave, rose from the dead, never to die again. Amen. What this means is that Jesus is a trailblazer. He's, a, he's, a, he's an innovator. He's the first one to go in a certain direction. All you're doing when you look at Jesus is you're looking at your future. That's all you're doing. If you're a follower of Jesus here today, your worst case scenario is resurrection life with Jesus forever. That's as bad as it gets for you. That's it. That's worst case scenario with you is that you'll be with him forever. We talk about following Jesus. Well, friends, you're supposed to follow Jesus through this life, through your death and up through. He's the firstborn. He's the first of many. He is in every sense the founder and perfecter of your faith. Amen. He's the firstborn from the dead and so holds the rank of superiority. He says that in everything he might be preeminent, that in everything he might be preeminent. This is the place where Jesus is to be praised. Friends, fourth reason Jesus is supreme is because he is the Father's means of reconciliation. He is the Father's means of reconciliation. Starting in verse 19 down to verse 23, you see twice the use of the word reconciled. Reconciled. Now, reconciliation is a gospel theme that is a benefit of the work of Jesus. By dying in our place, Jesus reconciles us to God. He deals with the sin that separates us from God. Our primary problem, your primary problem, my primary problem is not that I can't do my relationships right or that my finances are messed up or that, the, or that all this. My primary problem is that I'm separated from God by sin. All of your other problems are a result of that. And I'm not saying they're not serious. I'm just saying they have an origin. And twice here, we are told that we are reconciled. There are two arenas of reconciliation in verses 19, in verses 19 to 23. Arena number one is cosmic reconciliation. Cosmic. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. This is cosmic reconciliation. He means that because Jesus dealt with sin and death on the cross and in the resurrection through him, he can create peace between himself and the fallen creation. You see, we don't, we don't just believe that sin has affected us individually as people. We believe that sin has affected the physical world. That creation itself, once declared good, is not as it should be. Now, this is very relevant for us uh, on on May 21st of this year, Greenfield, Iowa was hit with an EF4 tornado that devastated that town. Why did that happen? Well, it's not because creation's good anymore. It's because it is affected by sin. We are seeing all of these pictures of this devastation created by this hurricane down south. We have, my family and I have family and friends. We have places where we used to live and walk and play, and there's whole signs that are completely underwater. Why is that? It's because the creation is groaning. Friends, the world itself is not as it should be. The world itself is broken. And when he says that he's going he's to reconcile whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, what he means is that Jesus, through his death, is going to make all things new. He's going to, as we will sing at Christmas, he comes to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. And the curse is found over every single square inch of this creation. And he will make all things new. That's the first arena. The second arena is personal. All throughout this passage, Paul has been saying he, he, and, and. And then in verse 21, he turns and he says, you. You. And he looks at believers then and he looks at believers now. And he takes them through who you were, 
what Jesus did for you and what you will be. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has been reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is what God has done. He has reconciled us back to the Father. It's personal. We are saved and we may be, we may be brought back into a relationship with him. Now, although there are two arenas of reconciliation here, there's only one means, the death of Jesus. It's spoken of in two ways. He says there in verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He then says in verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death. What does he mean? He means the only way that sin is dealt with, whether it's cosmic or personal, is through the death of Jesus. The only way my sin is dealt with and your sin is dealt with is by the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross in our place for our sins. Later in the letter, Paul will say that everything that we ever did, everything you ever did, everything I ever did is written down on this ledger. And it's everything because God's omniscient and he knows everything. And when we put our faith in Jesus, God, it's as if God took that with everything written on it. He nailed it to the cross, washed it with the blood of Jesus and made you clean and reconciled you back to God. That's what Jesus has done for you. And it happens through his death. This is what the gospel offers. You are reconciled back to him. Friends, those are four reasons why Jesus Christ is superior to everything in every way. I think this begs a question. It's a question I have for you, a question I've, I've asked myself. Have I personally acknowledged the supremacy of Christ? Have I personally acknowledged the supremacy of Christ? You don't talk about this in any other way. In fact, one of my, one of my favorite ways to talk to, uh, to, talk to people um, about Jesus, I used to do this with college students, is, is, to, is to talk to them about this argument that C.S. Lewis used. He, he said, he said, if you take everything, if you take everything that Jesus said about himself, okay, I, I, everything that he said, I, I mean, the, the kind of guy who says, I'm the light of the world, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The, ki the kind of man who says, I am the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me will never die, though he die, he shall live. The kind of person who said the kind of things Jesus did, said and did the kind of things Jesus did, is simply not someone you can ignore. That's what this passage is having. We just cannot ignore him. Lewis went on to say, you basically have three options as it relates to Jesus. And what the Bible says about him, it's either, it's either lying to you about him, it's either all just crazy talk, or number three, it's exactly, Jesus is exactly this. He is this kind of supreme. He is this kind of superior, this highest view of him that you can have. And the question is, is my heart aligned with this? And if it is, if I have acknowledged the supremacy of Christ, then the response is obvious. We worship. We worship we call you to follow Jesus. We call you to worship Jesus. Sometimes in church services, they'll have, they'll have a call to worship. What I'm trying to say to you today, friends, is this. I'm trying to say this. I'm trying to call you to a life of worship. If you have acknowledged the supremacy of Jesus, that means that you believe that if he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. You, you can't hold nothing back from him. If he is this, you have to give him your whole life. You, if he is this, you can't tell him no. At least without consequences. Friends, who is Jesus to you? Well, he's my Lord. Do you live like it? Because he's Lord of every single square inch of creation. Is he Lord of every single square inch of your life? What has he not touched yet? Why would you not let him touch that? He's the best king you'll ever have. Here's what's interesting. People have come and said to me before, you know, Jesus never, never, Jesus never said he was God. And, and, and I think that's, well, that, that's crazy. I mean, have you read what he, the, what this, some of the things the man said? But even, even if you forget what he said, you know what's interesting? There are people all throughout the Gospels that fall down in front of Jesus and worship him. Like, literally worship him. I mean, they, like, bow down and they, like, call him. Peter does this. The disciples in Matthew 28 do this. And you know what Jesus never does? Hey, knock that off. Never. Jesus never said he was God. I'll tell you one thing. He never discouraged people from falling down on their face in front of him. Because he's God. Friend, have you personally acknowledged the supremacy 
of Jesus. Do you believe that he is superior in the best way imaginable to everything in every way? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you're kind to give us your word and you're kind to give us a few moments to think about it. Lord, my simple question is, have we acknowledged the supremacy of, of your son? And so we're going to take just a few moments and we're going to consider all, all, the, all, all the things that Jesus says and all the things that are said about Jesus. Lord, we want to wrestle with these things in our heart. If we're a believer, we want to, we want to tend to this. We want to look and see, is there, is there, is there areas of my life? Is there, if, if Christ is Lord, then he is Lord. He's not, he's not Lord of some things. He's, if Christ is not, the, the, the kind of claims that are made about Jesus, if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. Lord, I pray that you'd have us grapple with this. If we're here and we're not a Christian, this is the best place to be. And Lord, perhaps we need to grapple with the fact that if, if this guy just kept preaching and preaching and preaching and answered every objection I've ever had to Christianity, would I then bow my knee to Jesus? I, I don't know. But it doesn't even matter because it is about authority. It's about, it's, about, it's about a transference of reigning in our lives and who is king over our lives. So, Lord, I pray now that you would give us a moment as we just, as we just think and pray. Have we personally acknowledged the supremacy of Jesus? Jesus, we ask that what we know not you would teach us, what we have not you would give us, what we are not you would make us. Lord, we, we pray that you'd make us worshipers, worshipers of you, you Jesus, glad worshipers. We're, 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 we're commanded to worship you, have no other gods before me. Well, Jesus, you are God. We should not, we should have, we should, we should not worship you in any way that we see fit, like the second commandment says. We should, we should worship you according to your word. We should, we should not make your, take your name lightly. Jesus, fill us with these thoughts. Perhaps, perhaps you're discipling us now and you're raising our view of who you are. Just a couple of clicks up. And each and every week, we'll see you grow larger and larger and larger until you are in full view of our sight. Lord, continue to grow us in this as a church and as people. And Lord, fill us, fill us with an understanding of your lordship as we leave here. Lord, every single square inch belongs to you. So, so we, we, wanna, we wanna configure, we wanna calculate, we wanna think, what does that mean? to call you Lord everywhere. Lord, shape and fashion us in this likeness. May these words find root in us and change and transform us. And Lord, we're gonna go from here and we're gonna be a body. We're gonna be the body of Christ with you as our head, united, spiritually united to you, drawing life. These are good things to rejoice. We are the company of the redeemed, following you through to resurrection, the trailblazer, the innovator, the first, the one who went up through the grave never to die again. Jesus, you said, you said, and I believe you. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Well, Lord, I, I wanna, I'm gonna put all my chips over on your square because that's who you are. Jesus, give us this kind of faith, we pray. Help us now as we go from this place. In your great name we pray, amen, amen.